Dr. Sheila Keating. Uh, Keating is an adjunct pro associate professor at the University of California, San Francisco, as well as uh, the vice president of immunology at GigaGen, a company working on the next generation of antibody drugs. Uh, over the past 15 years, Sheila's work has focused on understanding cellular and humoral immune responses to vaccines and infectious diseases. And more recently, she has focused on using high throughput immune assays to measure biomarkers of immune response or pathology. And uh, I will hand over to uh, Sheila now, who, who, who will start talk. Thank you, Sheila. Oh, no problem. Um, so thanks everyone for joining today. Um, the first thing I just wanted to mention is that when I when I first learned about GigaGen, I'd been working in academia for many years, uh, and I was pretty blown away by the ability to capture an entire antibody repertoire. There's also the capability of capturing T cell receptors using the same technology. Uh, but thinking about you know the plasma drugs that are being manufactured uh, and that requires collecting plasma from individuals. Uh, this technology is able to mimic that by capturing the B cells from plasma donors and uh, recreating that recombinantly. And there's a lot of things that you can do to make it even better by uh, by engineering the FC receptors or focusing on specific antigens. So, so I'm going to talk uh, about that um, today. And I also wanted to mention that this week, uh, we announced that we are now part of Griffles, which is a plasma manufacturing company based in Barcelona. And so uh, we are now Gr Gigagen, uh, a fully owned subsidiary of Griffles. So today I'm going to talk to you about single cell technology for antibody development. Um, this is this is being used for antibody development you know, a lot of it is uh, is we're developing monoclonal antibodies for immune oncology or for infectious disease work. Uh, but this technology that we're using at GigaGen is able to capture individual B cells and then recreate the genetic, take that genetic material and recreate that entire antibody repertoire uh, by, by using that genetic material in manufacturing cells such as uh, Chinese hamster ovary, cells um, and so we're able to to capture the the antibody repertoire and you manufacture that in an industrial scale to provide uh, the polyclonal antibody protective immunity or um, the drugs that that require that polyclonal response um, and so this approach has enabled the creation of the first recombinant polyclonal immunoglobulin therapies, and um, and we're looking forward to continuing to expand the the uh, number of drugs that we're able to create and target um, that are currently using a plasma-based products for, um, and so we're looking to um, we're interested in seeing how this space develops. But not only are we able to capture the entire repertoire, we can focus that repertoire to specific targets of interest. Uh, and I will talk through some of those in just a minute. But not only are we able to take the entire repertoire, but we can focus that and, and select individual monoclonals. And these can be used either for, uh, for things like immune oncology, or if a monoclonal antibody is required for uh, for targeting and neutralizing viruses, for example, that can also be done using the same technology. So uh, today I'm going to talk about, we have a paper that is currently in press and will be out hopefully in the next um, few weeks, and it covers a number of topics. So we have demonstrated that this technology can be used for developing antibody therapeutics for rapid response, uh, and we've done this uh, for SARS-CoV-2 and for Zika and Dengue. We've also looked at the ability to develop an IVIG type product. Um, so people who are immune deficient, who have primary immune deficiencies, are uh, they are afflicted with um, bacterial infections more frequently than people who do not have uh, you know, fully functioning antibody uh, response mechanisms. So we can enrich for the antibodies that will target bacterial um, pathogens such as strep pneumo or Haemophilus influenza. Uh, and we've done this and demonstrated this in uh, our, our upcoming publication. 
There is a, a drug called antithymocyte globulin. This is used for treating people who uh, receive kidney transplants. So it knocks down the cellular cell mediated immune responses that uh, will fight off transplants. Uh, and so these drugs are currently being made in rabbits or horses where they are immunized with th human thymocytes. The plasma from rabbits or horses are is harvested and that is the drug. So the plasma from the rabbit or the horse is injected into people prior to receiving a, a kidney transplant. So we have used a humanized uh, mouse in order to develop this drug and, um, and it's fully human uh, ATG that's, that could be used for, uh, for people who, are, who have um, uh, immune responses or to, to tone down the immune responses to transplants. So the, the final thing I wanted to mention is that with our uh, drug for Zika and Dengue, we've also used that humanized mouse and we have engineered the FC. Uh, one of the biggest problems with antibodies to Zika and Dengue is it causes antibody dependent enhancement. So increases the ability of the virus to infect the target cells because it binds, doesn't neutralize, and then that virus uh, is able to better infect cells. So if you engineer the FC so that it does not interact with the FC receptor of, on those cells, you can uh, prevent Zika and Dengue from this antibody dependent enhancement. So that is uh, another uh, thing that we've demonstrated in this manuscript. But today I'm going to really focus in on the work that we've done to develop the therapeutic for SARS-CoV-2. So as we know, uh, viruses will infect and the, the innate immune response kicks in. We have the antigen presenting cells that will take up those, those viruses. And then we have this adaptive immune response that will develop that uh, induces both the T cell and the B cell response. Uh, so the B cells will, um, will turn into, they'll, they'll evolve into plasma cells or plasma blasts that will be producing the, uh, the antibodies that are necessary for neutralizing and clearing virus. Um, and then those plasma cells will become either long-lived plasma cells or um, will also have a B cell, memory B cell population that will be there uh, to provide protection in the future. So we have, uh, with after an infection, we know that we need the T cells to clear infection. We need that T cell response to not only uh, clear the infection, but also provide cytokine and other support for, for developing that adaptive immune response. And then we have the B cells that will produce antibodies that will either neutralize or clear, uh, clear the um, virus infection. So neutralizing is one mechanism that antibodies are required in, um, in in preventing infection. And that's what the monoclonal antibodies are currently really targeting. You've got one epitope on that virus that a monoclonal can bind to. Uh, but antibodies definitely have other mechanisms of action. So uh, as the B cells are producing antibodies, you have a polyclonal response. They are able to bind to the virus to fix complement the FC receptors on the uh, antibodies can bind, uh, sorry, the, the FC on the antibodies can bind to FC receptors on antigen presenting cells, and that will also help with developing that adaptive immune response where uh, you can get the T cell activation, cytokine support, and development of the, the chemokines necessary for pulling in those immune cells. So there are other mechanisms of action that are necessary in clearing virus. Uh, and we know that polyclonal antibodies are required uh, and necessary for, for both neutralizing and also for these non-neutralizing activities. So as I mentioned, we're now, now part of Griffles and, uh, and the convalescent plasma has been one of the primary sources of, uh, of therapeutics for SARS-CoV-2. So in order to develop a a plasma derived drug you need to identify people who have been recently infected and i think recent is is an important term here because you need to have antibody levels that are quite high um, in order to use this for a, an effective therapeutic
So after someone becomes infected, they develop this polyclonal antibody response. And as we discussed, that's required for neutralization, antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity and antibody dependent cellular phagocytosis. So the plasma can be collected and either used directly as a, as a convalescent plasma drug or the, the antibodies can be um, concentrated as a hyperimmune. So in cases where, um, where no, uh, we, we can't identify people who are infected or um, we don't have enough plasma um, to treat people, we can immunize humanized mice with the antigens that we believe are necessary for a protective immune response. So for a lot of the monoclonal development work, uh, it relies on the, the isolation of memory B cells. So the, the antibodies are expressed on the surface of the cell, and that allows you to select for the antigen specific memory B cells by fluorescently labeling an antigen, doing flow cytometry uh, to isolate individual cells, and those can be cloned um, and immortalized. So this is kind of the primary way that groups are doing uh, monoclonal antibody development. But once the antibody, once the B cell evolves into a plasma cell, um, it, it doesn't necessarily um, continue to express that antibody on the surface of the cell. So we have a lot of cells that are producing antibodies, but they, they don't necessarily express them tethered to the surface. So I wanted to give that kind of foundation to lay, lay the groundwork for the, the, where we begin. So as you know, about a year ago this time, we were, um, everything was entering into lockdown um, and we knew that we needed to do something to, um, to help develop a therapeutics. There's, there's really, we had, we had nothing to begin with. So um, we were looking for laboratories that were that were identifying people who had SARS. Um, and we found that there is a, a laboratory in New Orleans that New Orleans, it was uh, about Mardi Gras. Um, and there are, are a lot of people who, who were becoming infected because of the celebration. Um, and so these, this was kind of a prime spot for looking for people who had, um, who, who were infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, so, they they identified 50 donors in New Orleans, and originally we were looking at donors who or or individuals who had symptoms of SARS, since they didn't initially have a test for uh, a molecular test for looking at SARS. So we wanted to recruit people who are symptomatic, and then as the tests became available, they began to confirm that people who are symptomatic actually did have SARS-CoV-2. And then we, we were able to confirm uh, the titers of, of people who were infected by doing an antibody assay. So uh, antibody assays also were not available, and so we, were, we had to develop the antibody assays in-house and um, there were papers that were coming out at the time. There's um, a paper by um, Fatima um, Aminat at, um, the, at Mount Sinai in New York that kind of published one of the first papers that uh, was used for, um, for measuring the titers of antibodies. So as we received these donors, we took the plasma um, from the donors. We looked at, um, we coated plates, ELISA plates with the antigens and then we did a titration. So this, um, this let me just get my pointer. Uh, this graph represents the, each line represents a donor. Um, and we did a titration of the donor's plasma from, from highest concentration down to lowest concentration. Um, and when we, when we saw that the, the line shifts to the left, we know that the antibody concentrations are, are high in those individuals. So we were watching um, for these, these lines and we, we selected the individuals that had the highest titer of antibodies because we knew that if you had a high titer of antibody, you had a lot of antibody producing cells. Um, so we recruited uh, 50 originally and we selected out of those 50, uh, 16 donors that had high titers um, and we created eight libraries of antibodies of two, do two donors each. Um, and so the median onset of symptoms was about 20 days and the median age of the group was 47. 
So we looked at both spike and the receptor binding domain as the primary readouts for, for our donors. Um, so we took the blood, we isolated the B cells. So we isolated all of the B cells um, using a, a bead, bead based kit. And uh, so these would include both the plasma and um, memory B cells. And I did have a, a movie here, but what you, what you would see is that the B cells are, um, they enter into this, this um, chamber um, through this, this pore. Um, and we, we incorporate lysis and capture beads through this pore. Uh, and this carrier oil will bud off individual cells and beads in these little droplets. So in each droplet, there's an individual B cell. The B cell is lysed and the genetic material is captured onto a bead. And that allows us to, uh, to capture the heavy and light chains from individual B cells. And, and through um, PCR, we're able to link that heavy and light chain together. And this is called a single chain variable fragment. So these single chain variable fragments with the heavy and light chain um, can be cloned and expressed onto the surface of yeast. So this allows us to select for antibodies that, uh, that are specific to certain antigens. Um, and in this case, we weren't sure which antigens to go after, but from previous publications from the original SARS, we knew that the spike protein was probably the most likely candidate. Um, and we knew that the receptor binding domain was the domain that would allow the SARS-CoV-2 antibody, or SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, to bind to the ACE2 and infect cells. So we wanted to really focus on the receptor binding domain. Um, and so that's the primary antigen that we used for selection. So this is a fax plot. This is looking at the yeast libraries that are expressing the entire antibody repertoire from each individual B cell. Um, and on the x-axis is, uh, is a tag called CMIC. Uh, and on the y-axis is the fluorescently labeled antigen. So in this uh, quadrant, this double positive quadrant, we know that the CMIC is, is expressing the antigen. And we know that the antigen is binding to the antibody that is expressed on the surface of the yeast. So we have our eight libraries of two donors each. And before even doing any kind of enrichment, we can see that the, the percentage of antibodies that are specific to the receptor binding domain is, is quite high. It's usually it's, you know, we, we see um, within, you know, less than a percentage, but here we have um, between a half percent and, and over 2% of the entire antibody repertoire of these individuals is specific to SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain. So in order to, to really um, capture and make sure that we have enough of each of those antibodies, we'll take the yeast, we'll grow it in culture, and then we can once again uh, capture, sort for those um, antibodies that are specific to the receptor binding domain. And what we have um, before we do the sort, we have, you know, you can see that each of our eight libraries is expressing or is a, expressed as a different color. Uh, we have thousands of antibodies prior to sorting, but after we do two sorts, we can enrich for uh, each of those individual antibodies um, that is specific for, for the receptor binding domain. Um, what's interesting here is that there is a, a lot of overlap uh, across the um, in, across the individuals for very similar sequences, and this has been uh, shown in a number of publications in the literature. So, um, looking at the timeline, uh, we started in March. We received our first samples in April, and by May fifth, we had all of the sequences that we needed um, that we that we wanted to work with in order to develop our therapeutic. And a month later. We had cloned those into our uh, manufacturing cell line in a site-directed way so that there's a single integration of a single antibody in each cell. 
uh, and this was ready to be sent to our manufacturing organization for production. So within a few months, we were able to go from absolutely nothing, no, no assays, uh, no understanding of, of uh, what we needed in developing this therapeutic, all the way to, um, to sending it off for manufacturing for clinical, um, uh, for clinical development. So one really interesting thing, I really like this, uh, one really interesting thing about uh, our technology is that it is capable of understanding or gleaning a lot more information about the the response of of these individuals to the um, to the virus. So we were able to uh, to when we do the sorting, we're able to see that heavy chain um, to get information about the isotype of the natural immune response of the um, of the donors. And so this is looking at a graph that is that is showing the antibody response prior to sorting. And you can see that the, the entire antibody repertoire, uh, it, the majority of the antibodies are IgG1 um, and then IgG2 and, and um, further down the line. So at this point, we didn't really know what kind of an isotype was required for developing our drug. Um, there's question of, there were questions about antibody dependent enhancement um, and, and selecting an IgG1 or 2 may interfere with, uh, with the antibody, you know, may, may encourage antibody dependent enhancement if that was the case. Um, but what we saw after sorting is that all of the receptor binding domain specific antibodies were all IgG1. And so we wanted to make our drug to mimic that natural immune response as much as possible. Um, there was only one of the RBD specific antibodies from these donors that was not IgG1. And so we really felt strongly that IgG1 was, uh, was the way that we needed to go. Okay, so um, what we what we've done now is you know we we um, have have created our library we've sorted it for uh, specificity to receptor binding domain and then we wanted to really understand what our final we didn't even at this point we didn't even know how our drug uh, reacted or what, a, what what is the function of our drug in vitro um, and so we're you know, we're going out on a limb and we we sent it for production, but now is the time we took to really characterize our drug um, to see how it acted in, in comparison to um, convalescent plasma and also monoclonal antibodies. Um, and so we performed a number of different assays on our final drug. So um, I'll walk you through this. The, the two graphs here are those uh, graphs that I talked about earlier. These are the ELISA assays. Uh, shift to the left demonstrates a higher titer that's specific for the receptor binding domain or the spike antigens. These green lines represent the plasma, the matched plasma donations that we were received from these donors to make that, uh, to make the, mono, uh, the poly, our polyclonal therapeutic. These red lines represent two monoclonals that were commercially available, uh, and we wanted to make sure that we use that as a benchmark to see how good our antibody was compared, or our therapeutic was compared to the, the currently available monoclonals. Um, and you, as you can see from the ELISA, uh, it's quite similar. It's, um, they're all, all on top of each other. Our drug, which is in blue, um, is very similar to the, to the monoclonals, and it's about a thousandfold different difference um, in potency from the plasma drugs. We also created a pseudotype neutralization assay, um, and this is um, creating a virus that expresses the spike proteins on the surface of the virus, um, but we're able to use it in the laboratory um, in a safe way. So we wanted to see, is our drug capable of neutralizing uh, the virus? And what we see is that our drug is, a, is um, very good at neutralizing the virus. It's about a hundredfold better than convalescent plasma. Um, and it's very similar to this monoclonal that is capable of also neutralizing. What was interesting is that one of the other monoclonals that we're using does not neutralize at all. Even though it's capable of binding, it does not neutralize. So we knew that uh, the FDA and other groups would want to know, well, how does it 
how to respond to the real virus. And so we worked with Duke University who had a, a virus assay um, available to use. So we tested the convalescent plasma. We tested our individual sorted libraries um, and we looked at our, our developed drug and we found that it was uh, significantly more potent in neutralizing the real virus uh, than our convalescent plasmas. And then when we compared the pseudotype neutralization assay to the, to the live virus, we saw that there was a correlation between those two results. So we knew that we could go back and use the pseudo, pseudotype neutralization assay. We didn't need to use the live virus. Uh, that is very difficult because it needs a BSL-3 facility to do that. OK, I think this is probably the most important question that, that we're seeing right now is how does it respond to the different variants? Um, and since it is a polyclonal library, it will be inherently less resistant to uh, viral mutations. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this was the case and we did this in a couple of ways. So once again, this is looking at an ELISA. We took the receptor binding domain from a number of different variants. Uh, we coded plates and we did our, our dilution series to see um, what the curves look like. So for all of the variants for SARS-CoV-2, we found that they were they were pretty much on top of each other. Um, and we look at the EC50 as a way to, to compare those different variants. Um, and we see that they're very uh, similar. So one thing we do see is that um, the, the, the human coronaviruses are not um, antibodies to the human coronaviruses are not in the same library, so that it was not sorted with the receptor binding domain that we that we sorted with. And then, in addition, um, there is some cross reactivity with the original SARS uh, virus. So, this is this drug is capable of of working against the original SARS and potentially other variants that that come come along. So we saw in previous experiments that uh, you can have binding, but you don't necessarily have neutralization. So we wanted to make sure that um, that our polyclonal drug was capable of neutralizing these new variants. Um, and so we created a pseudotype neutralization assays using the new variants um, and looking at uh, GIGA 2050 is now the name of our new drug, um, but we also looked at this monoclonal and we looked at the standard um, provided by NIBSC is 2130. We wanted to look at how they compare. So we can see that the monoclonal antibody and our polyclonal drug are on top of each other um, for the variants, for all of the different variants. Um, and it's about, uh, it's about 100 times more potent than the NIBSC standard. We see this once again with the other variants that are currently available. And one thing that we found to be interesting is uh, with the South African variant um, that it completely loses the, the monoclonal that we're using, completely loses the ability to neutralize. So we felt really good that, you know, uh, of the variants that are currently circulating um, and we're, we will be continuing to monitor this as we move forward. Um, but it is capable of neutralizing all the different variants. So I think the final question about a polyclonal drug is how does it manufacture? Um, and one of the uh, biggest questions that we have received is, is it consistent run to run? Can you take the same batch of cells that you use to make uh, a, a, the polyclonal drug? Um, and make it again and again, and do you see the same antibody clones come up? Um, and what we did is uh, this, we've done a number of different uh, large batch runs, and we see that the, the antibody um, profile looks very similar looking at the ELISA. Um, it's very similar looking at neutralization. And then when we do some analyses looking at Jacquard and Morosita, uh, we can see the correlation is very good. So we know that our run-to-run -run consistency is, even though it's a polyclonal drug, our run-to-run -run consistency is very good. Okay, so what are some of the considerations for making a recombinant drug? 
Um, and, and I think that this really applies to, you know, I, I've talked through some of the methods that we used for making a drug specific for SARS-CoV-2, but we can do this with any infectious disease or any target that you're interested in develop, developing a polyclonal drug. So, um, so, so some of the questions that I ask when I'm thinking about a new drug is, um, do we, what do we have for their source material? Do we have human um, antibodies or human B cells that we can use to develop the therapeutic? Or should we use a mouse um, that we can immunize with the antigens of interest? Um, the next thing I ask is what is the mechanism of action or what is the isotype that's required? So if we're looking at, um, we want to develop an antibody that has long, that is longer lasting, we can engineer the FC to be a long lasting um, antibody, or we can really um, engineer it to, to enhance that um, antibody dependent cellular cyto cytotoxicity or cellular phagocytosis. Um, or we can reduce the antibody dependent enhancement by completely um, abrogating the antibody's ability to binding to the FC receptor. Um, the other question I ask is what is what is the antibody being used for? Um, are we going to give it before infection to pre prevent um, to prevent infection such as a passive immunization? or are we going to use it as a therapeutic so that after exposure, um, people um, you, you can use this as a drug to treat? I think one of the key questions about developing these types of um, therapeutics is what is the dose? So these are expensive drugs, um, and so we need to consider how much of it do we need in order to, uh, to, to have the mechanism of action and to do what it needs to do to clear infection. Um, for, you know, for monoclonal, the dosing may be less, but if we demonstrate that um, that neutralization and antibody dependent um, cellular cytotoxicity mechanisms are are equal in clearing and um, eliminating or preventing infection, then our dose may be comparable to monoclonals. Um, and then finally, and I think the most important is thinking about the cost of manufacturing. Um, what is the the clinical studies that are required to demonstrate the efficacy of that drug? And then, um, how do we how do we administer it? Do we need it to be in a in, in a hospital, or can we dose it subcutaneously? And so, um, you know, as I as we began talking about these uh, plasma polyclonals, um, what are the biggest limitations in using plasma as a drug? Is uh, is we really need people who are infected or have high titers, and it, we need this. Um, but if we develop this polyclonal therapeutic, we have a renewable supply. We have a, recept a research cell bank of these cells that are producing these antibodies uh, that we can go back to. And each of those batches is consistently manufactured and demonstrates that it functions in the same way. Um, and so we know that that uh, that is much different from uh, potentially plasma drugs, plasma drive drugs. Um, we can actually uh, engineer this or we can enrich this for antigen specific responses, whereas a plasma drug, um, we, we know that there are a lot of other antibodies that are targeting a lot of other things, diluting out that antigen specific response. Um, and as I mentioned, we can engineer it to increase the half-life um, or we can enrich it to, um, to we can really target the mechanism, mechanism of action. Um, and then compared to monoclonals, uh, as we see, the monoclonals may not uh, bind and neutralize in the way that they were designed as new variants evolve. And so having a polyclonal that will bind to multiple epitopes will prevent uh, the virus from mutating and, um, and will be much more future proof in um, having a drug that will, that will be effective for much longer. Um, and as I also talked about, you know, the, this technology will give us a little, a lot more information as we develop vaccines. Um, and and I would really be interested in understanding more about the different um, different vaccines and the breadth of the antibody specific to antigens that we're immunizing with. 
Um, understanding also the isotypes that are induced after vaccination, and that will, you know, what are the mechanisms of the antibody, um, the alternative mechanisms. So not just neutralizing, but, you know, are we able to induce that antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity? We can get some of that information by looking at the isotype of the vaccine induced immune response. Um, and so um, the, I just wanted to um, kind of cover, you know, we are capable of, of from, from initiation and, um, and collection of specimens, we were able to develop this drug that we now have, um, we're planning the clinical study and hopefully we'll be dosing in the next few weeks um, in less than a year. And so and I think that this is kind of an amazing, um, it's, it's been an amazing experience to be part of. This will be the first recombinant polyclonal antibody therapeutic. Um, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, how this performs in the clinic and, and um, in the next few weeks. So I wanted to finally thank um, everybody who has been a part of this. It's a, it's a very lean group, lean team of people. We have we 33 and um, these groups have, uh, the people in this picture have have really contributed in, in a number of different ways, but um, but it's been an amazing experience, and I'm really happy that um, that I've had this over the last few years, and I'm really um, glad that I was able to tell my story today. So, um, hopefully, uh, you'll have some interesting questions after. Hi there. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, Blakely. Sorry. Can I just briefly say, Helen, um, I, I'm very happy, and if Sheila's happy to go on, but officially, uh, this is a 45 minute session. Um, so, if anybody has <laughs> a question as before they have to go, um, just let us know you've got to go and we'll put you to the front of the queue. Is that okay, Helen? Yeah, no, of course it is. Of course it is. Blakely, hi. So, Sheila, uh, welcome and apologies. I couldn't join right at the start because I had an overlap, but um, lovely to see you again. Uh, <laughs> and, and really, I caught most of that. A really fascinating, lovely, lovely work. Uh, really impressive. I've got loads of questions, but I should, as chair, open it up to others first. So do put up your hand. I can see people in teams and see hands. Put up your hand or put a question in the chat if you have a question, please. Um, but while um, while we're waiting for that, so you answered one of my questions in your last sentence. This will be the first licensed, assuming you get that far, polyclonal product. Yes. Uh, because of course, although we use polyclonal products clinically, they're not, they're, as you say, convalescent plasma and things. They're not, they're not licensed and manufactured to these standards. So, yes. um, yeah, no, which is which is really exciting. So when you compared in some of your uh, viral curves uh, you showed, you compared convalescent serum with your product and your product was much more potent. Do you think that's just, and I don't mean to minimise it, just a dose thing that you've got a greater concentration or, or are there other ways in you which you think you're seeing that superior potency? So I definitely think it's a dose, it's yeah. a dose issue. Um, but when we think about how we're going to dose our drug compared to convalescent plasma, and I think the real the real question is going to be what is the titer in the human exactly. after dosing? Yeah. Um, and so when we do the comparisons, um, the the dosing for uh, convalescent plasma is is about 10 to 100 times less potent than okay. our, the, the final concentration of our drug. Okay. So um, what we believe, what I believe is that um, that our drug, you know, being su successful in using these types of therapeutics will be will be based on how the high, high the titer is yeah, in yeah. the person. So we're really looking forward to um, understanding that a little bit more, but we definitely know that you know with a high titer product, it's still not as you know in the arm of the person. Um, it's still going to be ten, at least tenfold less potent than our yes. drug will be. Yes, absolutely. And a quick follow-on question to that, and then I'll hand over to Maria, who I see has a question: Is durability? So, do you have any 
sort of uh, sense at the moment of from preclinical studies or or from from modeling of what your durability of uh, I mean, I guess it depends on how high you need it to be to be eff efficacious, but how long it'll stay there. Yeah, so our drug is um, is very comparable to an, any IVIG drug. OK, OK. So so we expect it to be um, a half life of about three weeks. OK. Um, and so, you know, we we expect as you as you dose, you'll have the highest titers at the beginning sure. and, and hopefully that will be effective in clearing virus. Um, sure. but, but you will have that cycling um, of the antibodies for uh, for quite a long time. After. Sure. So it would work for a virus, but not for TB where you need to treat for six months. <laughs> right, right. And unless unless for that you would engineer the FC for long lasting. Yes, absolutely. So, so I think that that's kind of um, and and hopefully if there is you know, for for TB, that if you're getting more of that cellular mechanism of action necessary, that you're exactly. clearing out um, and allowing the the TB that's um, that's released to be sopped up by the, the antibodies exactly. that are in circulation. Exactly. Thank you, Maria. Oh, Maria. Are you still there, Maria? Can you ask your question? Oh, sorry, I was in mute. This happened <laughs> anyway. I just wanted to thank you for your presentation. It was great. And um, Helen, you you asked the question that I had about half life. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. But, no, 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 no. That's great. But then I will follow up with another thing regarding half life as well. So, what 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 would be your perspective in the context of persistent infection, like asymptomatic infection that then can be uh, triggered. Do you think that it would be important to have uh, like a subsequent dose after the third week or something like that? Yeah, so so I would expect, I mean, for, for let's think about beyond SARS, um, you know, I would expect that you would continue to dose um, every few weeks. And so this is the this is the um, modality for for people who are immune deficient. They receive IVIG on a regular basis, um, and so you could use it in a similar way where you would treat every few weeks. So, and then once we engineer, once we are able to engineer the FCs, this is like my dream is once we get to that place, I don't know when it's going to happen, but um, then we'll be able to treat maybe every three months. You know, the antibodies would be would be cycled and, and reused over that time. So I think that's ultimately where we want to be. Yes. Very, okay, thank very, you. Very nice. You could use it then as prophylaxis for immunosuppressed people as well. Actually. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's um, you know uh, we're seeing more immunosuppressed immunosuppression with immune oncology yeah, drugs. Yeah. Um, so so I th that's definitely something that I'm working towards. That's a big market. Mohammed. Hi, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, my question may be a little bit technical for, for the starting material of your plasma. Would it be maybe easy or possible to use vaccinated individuals rather than going after infected ones? So that yeah, absolutely. protein is focused on etc. So, and we have plenty of people, 10 million people are vaccinated. <laughs> So you have plenty of that plasma. Yeah, well, so what's interesting about the vaccinated, um, so the FDA has has requested that people who are vaccinated with the mRNA drugs are not allowed, and I don't know if this has changed, but I haven't heard an update. They're not allowed to give plasma. And so um, what we haven't done, you know, since we have our drug now, we've got our donors in the freezer we can go back to, uh, what would be interesting is looking at the different vaccines to look at the antibody repertoires from the different manufacturers to see, oh, you know, what are the what's the diversity of that antibody response? Uh, what are the what's the FC that's associated with that antibody response? So, so going into a bit more characterization, um, and then we also see that you know there are some vaccines that claim to be less effective against new variants. Um, so understanding what is the diversity of that response specific to the new variants, um, how many, you know, how much of the antibody is capable of binding to those new variants. So we could we could think about using the technology, and I think that 
you know, the vaccine manufacturers, they don't know about us yet. <laughs> so so they they don't know that we have this, you know, the capability of seeing the whole picture. You know, it's not just on a, you know, individual a handful of cells or or looking at the protein itself. We can look at the genetic, all the genetic information that's associated with the immune response that's induced by those vaccines. So, so I'm looking forward to as um, as we as we enter more into that research realm um, to, uh, to answer some of those questions. But you're absolutely right, um, not just for SARS, but looking at any vaccine that is currently available and developing therapeutics for for targets that um, the vaccine is shown to elicit a, a effective response through antibodies. Thank you. That would be fascinating, wouldn't it, to look at the different delivery systems and see, because they're all focused on the same antigen, but they're using yeah. different delivery systems to see whether the delivery systems give you a different repertoire and then linking that, as you say, to efficacy against new variants, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you could do that because there's a population that's been vaccinated with one or other Most, of the vaccine. Yeah, so, yeah, you know, absolutely. you could do it uh, entirely independently, actually. Really interesting. Actually, the, yeah. so the, the question on new variants um, would sort of leads into one that I had, which is you showed very good, very potent efficacy against some of the variants of concern. Um, but what I couldn't because I'm not as familiar uh, with these curves as, as others may be, is was able to compare them across to see whether actually the potency you saw for the variants of concern was as good as for the wild type virus or not. Yeah, so so to to get to that question, um, there there is a readout, the IC50 readouts, and, and we can look at the, the numbers from those to see how it might change with the new variants. And we, we've shown that it's at least twofold. So it's a, it's got about a twofold um, variability um, across the different variants, which which isn't too bad considering, you know, the monoclonals just go flat like there's nothing. Absolutely, exactly. Yeah, no. yeah. well, and of course you, you have the advantage with your polyclonal product that, you know, every time there's a new variant of concern, you don't have to make a new product. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that since we know, we know it's like a twofold variation, we can expect that for any, we can expect the IC50 to be consistent in that twofold for any variant that comes along. So, um, so I'm, I'm waiting for, you know, the, the, the new pseudoviruses to become available so I can prove that hypothesis correct or not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Lovely, really nice work. Are there any other questions? So someone's just posted something in the chat. Hang on, let me see if I can. What would be the difference between, so this is from Cesar Lopez Camaco. Uh, what would be the difference between a polyclonal based antibody drug versus a cocktail of monoclonals? Yeah, so um, one of the biggest limitations with monoclonals is that you would need to demonstrate efficacy for each in a clinical study before you begin to mix them together. So um, there are two there are two arms of the FDA. One is the drug arm and one is the biologics arm. So the drug arm um, requires that very fine um, analysis of each individual drug before you can begin to mix them together. Whereas the biologics um, is much more of a polyclonal, you know, the, all the plasma drugs go through that zebra arm. So, so we're going through the zebra arm and we're considered okay. more of the biologic side. So, so um, one of the other limitations of the monoclonal combos is that um, we have seen Jesse Bloom is the, is the um, investigator on the publications. His lab has been looking at the ability of combinations of drugs to um, to continue to neutralize. And he's shown that even using combos, eventually the uh, the virus is able to mutate around this. Oh, and there's a group in the University of Wisconsin that is that is really looking into um, multiple using a virus that is um, that is highly prone to mutations. Um, has they've shown that there have been multiple um, uh, when you go through multiple rounds with uh, with you know two or or more of the monoclonal combos, um, the the virus is able to mutate around this. So, okay. 
and presumably there's a cost issue as well actually creating lots of monoclonals is going to be substantially more expensive than developing a polyclonal product yes yeah absolutely uh, and therefore a cost of goods as well yeah yeah so hopefully um you know uh we'll continue to monitor this it'll be interesting to see how um how things roll out but i'll keep you posted well well please do sheila look i think that's we should probably draw it to an end we're over time already but um, there are lots of comments in the chat about thank you so um you know that was a lovely seminar really interesting and i think uh, we wish you well in your clinical development and please come back and update us okay we will and, and looking forward to um the new the next new drug so so we're definitely going to be exploring other avenues for um, targeting infectious diseases. So we'll keep you posted on that. Too. Please do, absolutely. Lovely to see you, thanks Sheila. Yeah. Yeah, do you mind you. if I um, say a few things quickly? Oh no, of course not Blakely, right. go um, ahead. So can I ask you to stop sharing your screen and if I could ask everybody, uh, if you're willing to turn on your cameras and just wave. <laughs> um, oh, well done, well done Blakely, I'd forgotten this bit. And and one other thing, I've just posted in the chat the placeholder for our next um, our next industry seminar. Um, so uh, if everybody who has their camera on can smile and wave, and I'll try and get a picture. <laughs> so thank you very much. Everyone's got their camera on. Yeah, excellent. Um, so yeah, you can have a look in the chat, and you can see um, I've posted the link to the next seminar on the 27th of April, uh, which will be with uh, Graham Clark from Imbio. Um, uh, but we're we're just putting together the details from that. But you can book ahead. So I'm giving you a little bit of an advanced uh, option to join there. So click on the link and uh, continue the discussion here on the seminar channel on the in the, on the hub. If you have any questions you can drop us an, you can drop us an email you all have our contact details so um can i have a round of applause for uh, sheila please thank you very much everybody thank you. thank you bye, bye.